Dr. Elisita Carpenter is a native Baltimorean. She has, she's working currently as an urban e ecologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She has a, a bachelor's degree from Hampton University, which us old timers used to call Hampton Institute. She has a master's in environmental science from Christopher Newport University and a PhD from the University of Missouri, where she worked with, with uh, I gotta say this, with my good friend, Charlie Nylon. And Ilicita is going to, to talk to us today about Baltimore and bats. So Dr. Carpenter, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen real quick. All right, I think you should be able to see it now. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Awesome. All right, uh, so good morning, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my previous work with uh, bats in Baltimore, and also a little bit about my current work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, and this scene is just a vacant lot from one of the research sites um, during my dissertation. And so a lot of times people are curious, um, you know, why bats, why Baltimore? Um, and so kind of like what Stuart just mentioned, part of the reason uh, I'm focusing on Baltimore, or at least I did for my dissertation was I grew up here. Um, and really that's kind of when I began being a little tiny urban wildlife biologist. Um, I grew up in a little row house in Northwest Baltimore and spent a lot of time looking through the grass, looking for little bugs and flowers and you know, waiting for wildlife to show up in my backyard and also going to a lot of the local parks here. Um, so my beginnings really fostered that love of nature and that curiosity. Um, when I was a master's student, that was kind of my first experience with wildlife biology. Uh, the only person in the department at Christopher Newport who focused on wildlife focused on bats. And so I had an initial reluctance about that. Um, but the more I learned about bats, the more I ended up loving them. They're just such a unique mammal and they get a bad rep, but they're very important for the environment in so many different ways. And so um, I kind of decided then that I really wanted to continue uh, focusing on bats. I also had an interest in birds and I did some work with birds as well, but uh, not that much. And uh, several years later, I saw a volunteer position for someone needing assistance with studying birds in Baltimore. And I was wondering why, why on earth would you wanna study wildlife in the city? Why wouldn't you wanna go you know, outside of the city or someplace else to do that? But I decided to give it a try because I miss birding and um, it really opened my eyes even as a resident to like how much wildlife is really in very small spaces in the city. Um, my supervisor at that time now my friend and colleague, Dr. Christine Riga Brodsky, um, was doing her dissertation work on how birds use vacant lots. And so I spent several uh, summers helping her out. And over during that time, we both talked about what it might be like to combine my interest um, with urban ecology, with my uh, past interest in bats. And we talked to her PhD advisor, Charlie Nylon, who ended up becoming my PhD advisor. And I went to Mizzou um, and spent a lot of time going back and forth between Missouri and Baltimore um, gathering data. And that's a picture of me with uh, one of the bat detectors, which I'll talk more about later. And so I got my PhD a couple of years ago. Um, also, uh, certificate in science communication outreach because I felt it was very important to um, be efficient at sharing um, research, not just with other scientists, but also the general public and um, just conveying like my passion and love for it um, with others. Um, after that, I was a naturalist educator for the Cary Mary Nature Center, um, also part of Baltimore uh, Rec and Parks. And there I ran a master naturalist program because kind of tied into the science outreach. I thought it was important to um, have that kind of information available to folks outside of academia to learn about wildlife and 
learn how to share it with others. And then just at the beginning of this year, I began a position with US Fish and Wildlife uh, as their urban wildlife biologist at Masonville Cove, which I'll definitely talk about in a little bit. But first I wanted to give a little bit of background about, about Baltimore uh, in case some folks are not familiar with the area. Um, traditionally it was uh, Piscataway tribal territory. Um, Southeastern mixed forest kind of habitat. It's in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, it is coastal plain and Piedmont kind of region. Um, and then it was uh, founded as a colony, I think back in 17, the 1720s, I think. And since then, um, modifications started being made, population began increasing. And a lot of times with urban ecology studies, there's kind of this blurb that we always share talking about how you know cities are getting bigger and bigger and more and more people are moving to cities so it's very important that we study it um, but baltimore is kind of the opposite of that it's what we refer to as a shrinking city uh, it reached its peak population back in the 50s or 60s where there was about a million people here and since then it's been declining and currently it's a little over maybe 600,000 um, folks living in baltimore and so one of the results of that is that there are a lot of vacant buildings and you can see here in this picture some have been vacant for so long that the roofs have collapsed and there's just full grown trees um, coming out of them and so it has a very different kind of set of issues from growing cities um, and one of the results of a lot of these vacant buildings are vacant lots which is um, kind of the main area that my research was done in baltimore is also a green city um, we have the largest urban park on the East Coast, Gwyns Falls Lincoln Park, kind of here on the west side. Um, I just mentioned vacant lots earlier and area wise, we have just about as much vacant lots uh, as we do park uh, acreage, which is interesting. Uh, the Baltimore Eco Study, LTER was here for many years and folks did a lot of work um, examining things like water quality, um, looking at the trees and vegetation in the city, insects and social research. And I also participated in a lot of the bird research in and around um, Baltimore through BES. Um, you probably can't see it here on this map, but there's a little kind of piece of land sticking out from the water here. And that is Masonville Cove, which is the first urban wildlife refuge partnership designated by US Fish and Wildlife. Uh, they did that back in 2013, I believe. Um, urban wildlife refuge partnerships are slightly different from refuges because the land is not owned by fish and wildlife. Uh, it's kind of a collaboration between different groups. So we have um, nonprofit groups like Living Classrooms and National Aquarium. Um, there's the Maryland Environmental Service, the Maryland Port Authority, and we all work together um, to continue renovating this land and supporting it. Um, and allowing conservation to happen here and inviting the public to see it firsthand. Um, for many, many years, it was an industrial dumping site. It's located in South Baltimore and is surrounded completely by industrial area. Um, but since the early 2000s, um, renovation began happening where a lot of that stuff was, the dumping stuff was taken out, um, clean fill was put in and we started planting lots of trees and um, Kind of aquatic vegetation um, and just in the past you know eight or so years um, we've documented over 200 species of birds using the area and that includes a pair of bald eagles that actually nest i don't know if you can see my cursor but there's a couple of trees um, kind of off to the right and bald eagles have been nesting uh, at masonville cove for the past several years which is very exciting um, part of my work with Fish and Wildlife is twofold, so outreach and engagement is a big part, um, as well as kind of traditional wildlife research. So on one hand, I'm monitoring the mammals and the birds and the pollinators that are there. And on the other hand, I'm also doing things like creating programs and setting up a community science project where we can uh, engage a lot of the local residents there and becoming a part of the research project process. and wanting to have them feel like this is their refuge as well. So pivoting back to the focus of this talk, um, I already talked about the why Baltimore part, and now I'm gonna talk about why would I wanna focus on bats. 
Obviously, I'm very fond of them, but um, there are additional reasons for wanting to look at bats. Um, a lot of times in the urban ecology literature, there's a heavy emphasis on um, looking at birds and plants and pollinators. And so bats are kind of one of those taxa group that don't get as much um, research focus in cities. As I was starting to gather information about bats in Baltimore, um, I couldn't find any previous information on you know, what species were in Baltimore or even in the central Maryland area. So uh, we had no information on what was here or what wasn't here. Uh, as I mentioned before, they play an important role um, in the environment in terms of insect control. On top of that, they face numerous conservation threats. One of the biggest ones lately is white nose syndrome, which is devastating a lot of um, local populations of bats. And just as I was starting this work in 2015, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources um, decided to list all known species of bats in Maryland um, as species of greatest conservation concern. And so I also wanted to share a quick summary of uh, some of the background research when I was looking all this up about um, what had been seen in other cities um, regarding bats in urban landscapes. And it was very mixed, so there were um, some studies that showed it being beneficial to bats and some showing it was detrimental. And overall, I noticed the theme of it being very um, scale dependent, region dependent, species specific. So it really depends on the scale at which you're looking at it, what part of the country or world you're studying, and it depends on the species and what kind of traits they have as well. Um, but in general, it always alters the community composition there. So some bat species will thrive, some won't. Um, the amount of species that were present tended to be associated with what kind of vegetation was present in the city. So the amount of trees and canopy cover and things like that. Um, beneficial aspects to cities included things like the presence of buildings and bridges like the one you see in the background here um, in downtown Austin. So cities provide very unique types of bat roost. Um, they also provide additional sources of water and food sources with a lot of the um, street lights and things like that attracting insects, which is their um, prey choice. Um, negative impacts on bats include the increased risk of predation. And so cities having more things like feral cats and um, raccoons and opossums and things that will potentially try to eat them. Um, <clears throat> uh, increased chance of um, an increased risk of human bat conflicts as well, because of course, if you're living in bridges or living in buildings, um, people do not want you there. And a lot of times that can result in mortality. And of course, with these um, urban types of roosts, they tend to gather in larger numbers and that can also lead to an increased spread of disease um, and those kind of issues. So the first step that I wanted to take um, really was just to find out what was there before I could really start figuring out um, bigger research questions. Uh, so what I did my first field season was a pilot study. I used something called active acoustic monitoring. Um, and I'll play this video in a minute, but it's a small device that records echolocation calls that bats make so I could record what was there. And hopefully this will work. So you can see the little device is making these beeps and you can see the bat is kind of circling um, near this patch of woods um, looking for bugs. And so it picked up those calls. And so if I pause it here, you can see some little weird looking lines on there. And basically I would download all that data onto my computer and it would give me a bunch of time frequency graphs. And the way we identify bat species from this is that they have different types of calls and we can identify them just based on the shape and size of those calls. So um, there are two different species in this uh, graph here. You see um, one set of calls that are very steep that drop down to about 25 kilohertz. And just based on past research, we know that that comes from the big brown bat, which is a very common species um, throughout North America. And then you see the second set of calls that are very shallow, right around 16 to 18 kilohertz. 
And those come from a hoary bat, which is the largest bat species in Maryland. Um, unfortunately, not as common as the big brown. And so basically with this pilot study, I just ended up reading lots of these little graphs and identifying bats. And so with this pilot study, I was uh, doing these recordings for about 30 minutes, visiting several times at several vacant lots and several parks. This graph shows, um, oops, get back. So this graph shows the number of recordings. Um, an important thing I haven't mentioned yet is that when we do acoustic monitoring, um, we can't determine abundance or population density or anything like that in terms of numbers of individuals. Uh, acoustic monitoring lets us know what species are there and then how active that species is. And so these are just the number of recordings at different sites and the different colors are from different species. Uh, these first four are from vacant lots and the remainder are from parks. And I thought it was really interesting that there were a couple of vacant lots that had similar levels of activity as some of these much larger parks. And just for reference, I, I know some folks there are familiar with Baltimore. So this here is Canton Waterfront Park. This is Carroll Park here. And then this is Patterson Park here. So you can see those parks had similar or lower levels to these two vacant lots, which are very small compared to the size of these other ones. And so after that pilot study, I decided I wanted to focus on vacant lots, knowing that there's lots of variety in vacant lots and not much research has been done looking at how wildlife use vacant lots. And so I wanted to really look into what kind of factors, what was it about these vacant lots that might make them ideal for certain species. And so the one of the main chapters of my dissertation was just focusing on environmental variables. So looking at the trees, vegetation, water, things like that. So seeing if I could determine if there are certain variables associated with uh, higher species richness, so having more bat species present, but also within each species looking at the amount of activity, how active they were at these sites. Um, and also looking to see if there was a spatial component to this as well. Uh, this is borrowed from uh, Christine's dissertation. Um, when we talk about vacant lots, um, I think it's really interesting how much variety you can see in them. And uh, Christine really did a great job in kind of detailing this and discussing this in her work. Um, they can vary in shape and size, location. Uh, they can also vary in the way that they're used by people. And so sometimes they're basically discarded, not really used. Uh, some like this one, which we call a corner lot, people just kind of use to pass through um, while crossing from one street to another. Some are managed as uh, community green spaces or gardens, and some are used as parking lots. So there's a lot of variety in um, vacant lots. And so I was curious to see um, how that might impact bat species. Uh, again, I spent a lot of time working with Christine on her work. And so given that I was familiar with the sites that she used, I think it was 150 sites that she had. Um, I decided to kind of use that subset of vacant lots and randomly select from within those um, to use as my sites as well. And so I basically divided the city up into four regions because I wanted to make sure I got kind of an even spread of vacant lots throughout the city. And within each region, I randomly selected um, vacant lots to use for my sites. And I wanted to make sure that there were trees present. There was some open space. So vacant lots that were heavily forested, I couldn't really use because uh, it's hard to record clear bat um, recordings when it's very heavily forested. So they need to have some trees present, but also have some open space. Um, I also wanted to make sure they weren't very close to each other during the same year. And each year I did uh, 16 sites for a total of 32. And unlike my um, pilot study, I used passive instead of active acoustic monitoring. And basically what that means is instead of standing there and holding the device, um, I was able to get devices that I could just secure to a tree and programmed to start around sunset and record until sunrise. Um, 
and do the recording for me so I didn't have to stand there. Um, with these passive detectors, I was able to place them on trees about three to four meters high, kind of pointing towards uh, open space. And because they were in uh, neighborhoods, I wanted to make sure that people knew what it was and that it wasn't you know, a video recording them or audio recording their conversations or anything like that. So I had little signs just to let people know what they were and to contact me if they had any questions. Um, these were put out for three nights in a row at each site. So three nights was one session and I did three sessions for every site. So that was a total of nine nights of recordings for all 32 sites. And then afterwards I would download the information onto my computer and use a special program to look through the recordings and identify them. So that was the back component. And then the environmental component that I wanted to look at was um, looking at both the site scale, so things measured within the vacant lots, but also at the broader scale. So uh, this included things like canopy cover, um, how tall the ground cover was at the site, and getting an estimate of how tall the canopy was at these vacant lots, as well as counting the number of streetlights around the site. Um, at a broader scale, I used GIS to calculate um, create a 500 meter radius around these sites and then from there determine how much of that area, surrounding area, consisted of green space, so forest, other vacant lots, other green spaces, um, estimating the canopy cover at a broader scale, also calculating things like road density and vacant building density, and calculating how far these sites were from the center of the city and from the nearest water body. Uh, so for data analysis, that was two parts. One part was ordination and another part was using models in R. Um, with ordination, we did multivariate analysis that allowed us to visualize how similar or dissimilar sites were to each other um, in terms of what species were present and how active they were. And with the ordination, I was able to create hypotheses and candidate models um, for different species. And then with those candidate models, I ran those in our studio through linear mixed effect model regression to determine what the best model was that explained um, bad activity. And so between the two years, I recorded a total of somewhere over 33,000 sequences. And yes, I did manually look at every single one and identify it to the best of my ability. So lots of staring at the computer. Um, but these were the six species that I discovered using vacant lots in Baltimore. Um, as I mentioned before, the big brown bat is very common, and I think probably 80 to 90 percent of my recordings came from uh, big brown bats. Um, the second most common one is the red bat, which is what we call a foliage roosting bat, and they actually will roost directly on tree branches just hanging from them, uh, and they were at almost all the sites. And that was followed by the evening bat and the silver-haired bat. Um, and so those were kind of the four main ones we saw at vacant lots. There were several sites where we saw hoary bats and tricolor bats, but I would normally get just one or two recordings from those at those sites. So just because I didn't have a lot of recordings from those species, I couldn't do any modeling or further analysis of those two species. So all the analysis focused on these four species. Um, when it comes to the vacant lots that were in my studies, a lot of them, uh, the majority of them were basically these three kinds. So vacant blocks, so an entire block is converted to a vacant lot, um, corner blocks, and then what we call inner block lots. So they're kind of lots that are surrounded on all four sides by um, houses, primarily the backyards of those houses. Um, they're all in high density and medium density housing areas. Um, there really isn't that much low density housing in Baltimore and almost all of them were within one kilometer of water. There was a lot of variety in um, kind of that broader scale that I talked about earlier in terms of the amount of surrounding green space. And there was also a lot of variety in um, the number of street lights around the lot. And these are just some pictures of a couple of the lots just to show uh, some of the variety 
And so this shows um, one of the ordination graphs and I'm gonna do the, my best to explain, uh, do a short version of ordination. So I mentioned before that it's multivariate. So it incorporates all the different variables that I measured as well as the amount of activity from the different bat species. Um, it normally shows it um, or depicts it from three axes, but you can only see two at any given time. Um, and so this shows the different sites and the distance between any given site shows how similar or dissimilar uh, those sites were to each other. So if you look at axis one, it also gives us um, a table that has these numbers on it. So with axis one, uh, you see a strong negative association with uh, these two bat species, this bat species, and these variables. And so what that means is that on this part of the axis, um, sites that were here had a lot of activity from those species, but as you go further along the axis, the amount of calls from those species decrease. And so I was able to look at correlations for both species and different vegetation measures, and it helped me develop the initial um, candidate model. So you can see with like Atescus fuscus is the big brown bat. It has a strong correlation with the first axis, but also distance from the city center, um, canopy cover within that 500 meter radius, and the amount of, or the vacant building density are also correlated with those. So a potential model would be big brown bats have this association with these three variables. And this is just another way of showing um, what some of those candidate models look like. So again, I used the ordination that I just showed here to create some of those models. I also created a null model, which said basically, none of these variables have any impacts on the amount of bat activity. And then other models were based on what I had seen in the literature. Um, also models that looked at just local variables versus those 500 meter radius variables that were measured. And also making sure that variables included in any given model didn't correlate with each other. And then once I uh, did that work in R, I was able to determine which model was the best based on the lowest AIC value. And so when we look at the modeling results for those, again, these two species, not enough data to do analysis on, um, but for several species, um, distance from water was an important variable. Um, for some species, local variables. So again, the ones that were just recorded at the vacant lot. So for the big brown bat here, the amount of canopy cover present at the vacant lot, as well as how tall the trees were at the vacant lot were important variables. Uh, for other species, those vegetation variables at the 500 meter radius scale were more important. So um, how much surrounding canopy cover was present as well as um, the amount of green space or forested um, landscape that was present nearby. Um, other variables included the distance from city center and also the road density. So uh, for this species, I think the higher the road density was, the less activity we saw from uh, this species, the red bat. And so that was kind of the, that was the second chapter of my dissertation. Uh, the third one focused on socioeconomic variables instead of environmental variables. And so I basically took all that bat data um, I had gathered, and instead of looking at trees and water and things like that, I looked at more human focused variables. Um, in general, we've seen in urban ecology studies that um, human decisions, our culture, our lifestyle shape the urban landscape and in turn that shapes biodiversity and what species will be present. And that can happen in two different ways. Um, in a bottom up manner, in terms of individual households deciding, you know, what they want their yards to look like or uh, their income levels or things like that determining, you know, what their immediate surroundings look like and how that impacts wildlife. Uh, it can also happen in a top-down manner in terms of organizations or city government deciding um, what to do at a wider scale. And so that can include for, for example, the city of Baltimore deciding uh, 
how often they decide to mow parks and vacant lots, um, tree planting initiatives and what parts of the city that does and does not happen in. And also um, from past decisions, um, one of the major ones in Baltimore being segregation and redlining. And unfortunately, I definitely don't have enough time to go into that, but I think it's um, definitely something important to consider. And if you aren't familiar with the impacts of um, ecology and biodiversity when it comes to segregation and redlining, I would definitely recommend uh, reading up on it. Uh, some examples of um, socioeconomics affecting biology is the luxury effect, which has been documented in some studies, but not all, basically saying that uh, in areas or neighborhoods where residents have higher incomes, you tend to see more species present in those areas. And so, as I mentioned before, I basically just took all my bat data, um, used the ordination, used the modeling just as I used previously, but instead of environmental variables, I used different measures of race, wealth, education, family structure and neighborhood structure. And I gathered all that data from the US census website, um, mostly from the 2010 census, but also some information from their 2017 all community surveys. Um, use the same type of ordination and modeling as from before. Um, the specific things I looked at were first finding out what census block track each site was located within, and then for those census block tracks, um, determining what percentage of those had, or the percentage of vacant and rental housing present there, uh, the median household income, uh, in terms of housing structure, seeing how much of those census tracts had older um, housing present, looking at the amount of residents with just a high school education level, um, female householders with children, and Black residents. I also briefly looked into um, redlining ratings for those neighborhoods with this graph that we saw here before. Um, the homeowners loan coalition ratings from back in the 40s, which is what I refer to when I mentioned redlining and looking at <clears throat> what those ratings were for the current locations of these sites. And so using the same data analysis that I mentioned before, um, the main socioeconomic variables that seemed relevant were income, uh, the amount of vacant housing present and race were common predictors for the levels of bat activity. Um, for the red bat, the amount of housing built over 80 years ago was also an important predictor. And this is just my very brief investigation into looking at um, the vacant lots compared to the uh, HOLC ratings from the 1940s. Uh, basically, these ratings determine, you know, what kind of financial input um, cities or the city would give to um, residents in those areas. So um, if you were in an area that was rated as hazardous or declining, there wasn't a lot of financial investment happening in those areas. Um, <clears throat> and you can see with my vacant lots here, these are just kind of where they were located. And for the most part, you could see they were located in areas that had declining or hazardous ratings. Another thing I forgot to mention um, was that the how they determine what these ratings were was based on race. So um, declining and hazardous areas had those ratings because of those areas being predominantly African American or Jewish. Um, I also looked at some of the species and the amount of calls compared to those different areas. Um, I didn't see any very strong associations with um, the specific number of bat activity in different um, HOLC ratings. So starting to summarize some of this, um, basically I found out the same thing that I had read about at the very beginning of all this, that different species will use urban landscapes to different degrees. So some species, it's more important um, what's at the specific vacant lot. For others, it seems like the surroundings of the vacant lot are more important. Um, but for just about every species, the presence of trees were important. 
Uh, for some, it was at that local scale. For some, it was at a broader scale. Um, for all species, access to water was important. Uh, I think one of the great things about Baltimore is we have three different watersheds within the city, and they're all kind of equidistant from each other. So at any given point in the city, you are not that far away from a stream or a water body. <clears throat> um, for red bats, which are kind of slower flying species, um, that higher road density that I talked about seemed to be a deterrent to them. Um, similar to other socioeconomic studies with birds and plants, um, income kind of gave us an indication of how active certain species would be in an area. But also the neighborhood structure, um, so how old the neighborhood was and how much of that neighborhood had vacant um, property present can also play a role in what bat species are present. And so knowing this information now, what kind of things can be done to modify or adjust vacant lots to support bats? Um, given that different species have different needs, um, it's kind of hard to have a very specific answer for that. Um, just at the vacant lot level, you can always have things like tree plantings or um, supporting bats by putting up bat boxes, but bat boxes can be um, kind of a mixed bag. So sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. They only help a handful of species, not all bat species will use those. Um, another thing to consider is in areas where there are multiple vacant lots, having some that may have more trees, some that have less, so that um, they're kind of all in the same area and they can support multiple species at once. Um, another important thing that um, I really enjoyed reading from Christine's dissertation um, is learning to balance the needs of wildlife with the needs of local residents. She has a really great chapter in her dissertation uh, surveying residents about their thoughts and opinions about vacant lots. Um, and she found that city residents preferred vacant lots that have uh, clear sight lines and visible signs of management. So being able to integrate um, what residents prefer with what can also support wildlife is very important, I think. Um, and another thing to be mindful of is the potential for a green gentrification. So making these very nice spaces um, that don't result in people having to move out. Another thing I wanted to add is just, you know, what can we as individuals do to support bats in urban areas? As I mentioned before, bat houses are certainly a possibility, um, but you definitely have to consider lots of different variables in determining if um, they will use it. So having ones that are the right size, the right color, um, placing it up in spring versus setting it up in fall will give you very different results. And also the location. So places that get sunlight, are great for bats if you put up a bat house underneath a tree or in a shaded area that doesn't really help them and they probably won't use it. <clears throat> uh, some of the most important things you can do that help that probably help more than bat houses is um, just having native plants and vegetation pre present. Um, native plants provide habitat for insects and of course that's what bats eat so um, supporting their food sources is a great way to support bats. Also, of course, having trees present on your property or on vacant lots that you use or manage, uh, especially older trees, um, if it's safe to have older trees up. I know in some parts of the city, um, big trees can be a hazard and very inconvenient for residents, but in places where it's possible, it's great to keep older trees and even snags up as well. Uh, bats will use dead trees as well. Another thing to consider is bats have this very bad rep um, and that can also play a role in people wanting to kill them or keep them away. So um, hopefully I've provided some helpful information, um, just reading more about bats and sharing their benefits with others um, and kind of doing your part to reduce misinformation uh, is also helpful for bats, especially in cities. And I also wanted to add a quick blurb uh, about U.S. Fish and Wildlife and their role in urban programs. Uh, we have several different types of programs that I'm involved in in integrating those goals into the Baltimore region. 
Um, one of them is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Urban Wildlife Conservation Program, and there's a ton of information here, um, a list of all the different urban refuges and urban refuge partnerships. Um, we also have a webinar series that's posted online and it has all the past recordings of talks, um, not just looking at urban wildlife, but also, um, again, finding that human connection and learning to work with communities on um, wildlife conservation, urban nature. Uh, Fish and Wildlife also has an urban bird treaty program, um, again, bringing together lots of different groups to provide citizens and especially kids with opportunities to connect to nature, primarily through birding. Um, and this is also the link to the Masonville Cove Urban Wildlife Refuge Partnership. Um, it has a link to the Eagle Cam, which you can attempt to watch the eagles on. Um, they have two nests there, but unfortunately they are using the nest that is right outside of the camera's view, but sometimes you can see the eagles there. And it also has a list of events and programs and just more history about uh, the refuge. And so I will leave you with this view of Masonville Cove. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Yelisita, for a fascinating, <clears throat> um, for a fascinating seminar. Really wonderful to, to see the diversity of, of your work. There are some questions in the chat, so I'm going to open that up now. I don't know if you can see that, that not the chat, the question and Q and A section. Um, are you able to see that? Okay, I need to unmute. Hold on. Okay. Uh, All right, so let's go. <laughs> see the first question from Jacob. Uh, has anyone created software to identify bats from their sounds similar to BirdNet software for identifying birds and their calls? Yes, that is a great question. Uh, so there are software programs that can um, automatically identify calls. I was always taught to be cautious of them because there can be some errors um, in identifying um, bat calls. Um, another thing I didn't really get to touch on is that even within a species, there's a lot of variation in calls. So I mentioned that I want to record them in open spaces and not near forest or heavily forested spaces. Uh, the shape of their calls change when they're in a lot of clutter near trees. So they become a lot harder to identify there. And some species do have overlap, which was another thing I didn't get to talk about um, in terms of one of the issues with identifying them. So um, there can be some, you know, imperfections in um, using automated software, but if you're very familiar with the calls and they're not a lot of calls, then automated might be a great way to go. Uh, let's see, from Gail, we have, are these vets migratory? Uh, some of these are. I had a chapter that unfortunately I wasn't able to include in my dissertation where I did look at how calls varied by species throughout the year. Um, and the silver-haired bat, uh, the evening bat, the hoary bat, and some individuals from the red bat species do migrate. And I did notice an increase in some species activity during the fall. So they will actually migrate just like birds do um, during fall and spring. Um, where do they hibernate? So this varies for different species as well. Um, I mentioned that some red bats migrate, but some will stay here and hibernate. And they actually hibernate by dropping down into the forest floor and kind of burying themselves under leaf litter. So they hibernate under leaf litter. Um, other species will kind of do short-term migrations and maybe go from forested areas to caves and things like that out west and hibernate in caves. And species like the big brown bat, which will roost anywhere basically, they end up um, sometimes hibernating in houses and buildings and bridges. Um, what, oh, where do they raise their young? Uh, again, that depends on what kind of roost they're using. So I think for all the species that are here during the summer, they tend to be tree roosting species. So that can be, um, like the red bats who roost directly from trees, they just literally hang on the branch and just roost there. 
their young will be raised in the tree basically. Um, other species will roost in hollow parts of trees or under tree bark. Um, and again, some species using uh, buildings and bridges and those will be the places where their young are raised. Um, let's see, what is the status of understanding and mitigating white nose syndrome, which has decimated bat colonies in the Hudson Valley? Uh, does this syndrome affect urban bats more than those in rural areas? That is a great question. Um, one of the frustrating things about this um, research was just beginning to just touch the surface of what was here. And there were so many more questions I wanted to look at. And one of them was, you know, trying to figure out if white nose syndrome is affecting bats. I know some folks have hypothesized that cities may actually be kind of a refugia for bats and that um, those that choose to hibernate here, they may be hibernating in smaller numbers and that may actually limit the chance of them getting white nose. But there hasn't been a lot of research in um, urban hibernation roost for bats. So that's something I would love to look into again down the road. Uh, in terms of mitigating white nose, there's lots of folks trying lots of different things. There are um, people trying like sort of spray on treatments where they can like spritz something on the bats to kill the fungus, um, creating artificial hibernacula that can, once the bats are done using it, they can sanitize it and clean it out. Um, lots of different things being done right now to try to answer that question. Um, on the plus side, some species have been seen to they're starting to show uh, resistance to it. White nose has been around for, gosh, I think maybe 13 or 14 years now. And so we're actually starting to see some species showing a bit of resistance to it, which is great. I have an anonymous attendee uh, asking about accounting for uh, spatial autocorrelation and also addressing the different home ranges of each species. Oh, that's a good question. Um, and I am trying to remember for my dissertation, um, I'm forgetting the name of the statistical program or process that I used, but I did check for uh, spatial autocorrelation and I didn't see um, any issues with that um, from a statistical standpoint. Um, from what I did in R, but unfortunately I do not remember the exact process I went through to do that. Um, and that is another issue with uh, a lot of these species, they do have varying types of home ranges. Um, I assume that at the 500 meter radius, um, we would mainly just getting bats uh, passing through or just kind of to and from, um, or going to and from foraging sites. So unfortunately I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, I know with some species, their home ranges can vary by, you know, a few kilometers. Um, so this is just a very kind of a snapshot really of what's in the area. Uh, see the question from Gail about vacant lots being privately or publicly owned. Um, <clears throat> so for what I did with my work, um, I tried to make sure that they were all publicly owned. I think there was an initial misunderstanding that all the ones in Baltimore were um, publicly owned, but some were privately owned. Um, and for the private ones, I'm not sure um, whether or not they would be stable. Um, the, I visited some that were privately owned and they seemed like areas that probably didn't get a lot of change in ownership. Um, a couple of them were actually owned by neighborhood associations, especially in um, the wealthier parts of town. Um, some of them actually have like gardens in their own like private parks that were technically vacant lots. And so the neighborhood associations kind of maintain those. Uh, Linda says, I'm amazed by the number of bat species in the city. Uh, were residents aware of these bats? Did they notice a reduction in insects? Um, I only got to talk to maybe a handful of residents while I was doing this, unfortunately. Um, but probably one of my most enjoyable memories was one of these vacant lots uh, in Southeast Baltimore. And an old man came out of his house who was next door and we started talking about bats. And normally I'm used to people having like a uh, bat kind of reaction, but 
he was really cool about it. And he just started telling me like all this information about like when they were younger, they remember like tossing rocks up towards the street lights and watching the bats chase them. And then he was like, yeah, like all these churches around here, they all used to have bats flying out of them all the time. And then the churches like closed up the steeple so the bats couldn't use it anymore. And he seemed really worried that like all these nearby churches had, you know, closed off that access for bats to use and how it would impact them. So I imagine there's definitely a lot of um, kind of place-based knowledge about bats that I'm just not familiar with because I don't know um, all the different parts of Baltimore. But um, yeah, I imagine there's some residents who are definitely aware of it. Um, uh, Richard mentioned the lack of little brown bats. Yes, I was very disappointed by that. Um, when I was reading up on little brown bats, I assumed they would be here as well, but I did not get any recordings or at least none that I was could verify with any certainty were little brown bat calls. Um, there's a local group called Lights Out Baltimore that um, does a lot of work with gathering data about bird and bat collisions into um, buildings downtown. And I think maybe a couple of years ago, they captured one little brown bat that had collided into a building there. Um, I'm assuming that maybe because of things like that, we don't see them as much in the middle of the city and they may be more on the periphery of the city. But yeah, I was definitely bummed not to see any little brown bats. Um, and one of the papers that I looked up uh, was a study on little brown bats in Pennsylvania. And they saw a high mortality rate of um, myota species who were crossing highways to forage um, in forest on both sides of the highway. So I imagine if road density is a potential issue, then really any part of the city um, is going to be a little too much road for myotis to want to navigate. And also, as you, uh, as Liz mentioned with white nose syndrome, um, little brown bats, uh, northern long-eared bats, and tricolored bats have all been hit really hard by white nose syndrome. So it's also possible that there may have been more here in the city in the past and just with the timing of my work in whiteness syndrome, um, there's just less of them to be documented. Uh, let's see. Maya says, do you have an idea of which insects make up the majority of bat diets in Baltimore? Uh, that was another aspect of the research that I really wanted to integrate, um, making an attempt to look at what kind of insects were present at these vacant lots, which would be really important to know in terms of what bat species are in the area. But unfortunately, I just didn't have the bandwidth to look at insects. Um, in general, bats tend to prefer um, kind of the juicy insect species. So things like moths and beetles, which are um, pretty big, pretty concentrated in terms of protein. Um, those tend to be their favorites. Um, they'll also eat you know, flies and mosquitoes as well, but those are a bit smaller. Um, okay, there's one last question, I think. Okay. Well, let's we'll, sure. we'll give you a break after. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I'm not aware of any hibernacula in Baltimore, but I would not be surprised if there are some here. We just haven't had a chance to really investigate that, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, Exploring the effect of light pollution on bad occurrence. That was something I wanted to look at a bit more. Um, I used the number of streetlights kind of as a measure of light pollution, but I don't think that was the best measure of light pollution. I would have loved to have found another measure of light pollution, maybe something like street light density or um, using some other resource that documents light pollution. Um, but I imagine that could definitely have an impact on some species. Um, some of them don't seem to mind it. I've watched red bats circle around um, street lights for like 40 minutes at a time, just going in circles, eating bugs that are attracted to it. So it affects some species, but not others. Well, Ilicita, thank you so much for a really, really cool talk. And thanks for your generosity and answering all the questions. Mm -hmm. And um, those who've signed up for, for chats later, um, you know who you are and you'll be able to ask additional questions there. So thank you again so much. And thanks everybody from, uh, for attending. It's, it was really a great talk. Right. Bye everybody. Bye.